All right, now I'm turned on. Are we audible? Yeah. All right. This new mic makes me feel like a motivational speaker. <laughs> well, it has been a while since I've been up here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak on God's Word. Um, I'm really rusty on this, so I appreciate you bearing with me. It's been, I don't know, I think two years since I've done this kind of thing. Um, Like Eric said, Michael and I are teaching together. Um, Michael's going to take the second half. I'll do the first half. And we're speaking um, on 1 Thessalonians, continuing our sermon series in that book. Uh, We're going to be finishing out chapter 4 out of five chapters. And... um, Uh, Just to refresh us on the context of this book, it is the first letter from Paul to the church in the city of Thessalonica. Paul had visited Thessalonica for um, just a few weeks before he was run out of town. Um, In fact, they followed him to the next town and ran him out of that town too. Um, So when Paul uh, left the new, you know, baby believers in Thessalonica, he left pretty concerned about their well-being, um, also aware that he didn't have time to give them a full, comprehensive theological foundation of faith. And he knew that as soon as he left, he was leaving them with pretty significant opposition in their hometown. So we see in the first part of this uh, letter, when he finds out that not only do they still exist there, the church is there, but their faith is thriving, he's just excited that they're still there. And so he reaffirms his... um, his excitement in their faith and his concern for the church and his care for them. And we saw in the beginning of chapter four that Paul transitioned into providing some pastoral instruction for them and really gave them uh, the basics of what it looks like to live a holy life. Now at the end of chapter four, it's time for something completely different. Uh, He changes tack and we're going to see that Um, What he does in verses 13 through 18 is address uh, a point of confusion that he understands has has popped up in Thessalonica. And that confusion is related to the second coming of Jesus and to uh, eternal life with him and how that works itself out. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and, and read the passage. And it should be clear as I read um, what their confusion was, but but see if you can pick out what their um, what their concern was as we read Paul's response, starting in verse thirteen. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So is it clear in what Paul is saying, uh, what, they're, what they're running up against, what their confusion is? You know, it seems that since he left them, not only did they run into opposition from the community around him, but since he left, it seems that some members of their community have died and they've lost loved ones, not being clear on what death means when you're following Jesus. Now, it does seem that they are confident Jesus is coming back. In fact, three times already in this letter, Paul has referred to the return of Jesus, taking it for granted that they believed he was coming back. But they didn't know what to make of it if somebody died before Jesus came back. And so when their loved ones passed away, they wondered if those loved ones were going to miss the boat and, uh, and didn't share in this hope of eternal life with Christ And Paul provides a pretty straightforward answer. He says, no, everybody who follows Jesus is going to share an eternal life with him, whether they pass away before he comes back or not. And it feels for us now as if this is a moot point. 
right? We don't struggle with this <laughs> anymore. Uh, we have confidence that when we die, uh, it doesn't change our standing with Christ uh, uh, with, uh, you know, relative to if we're alive when he comes back. And so Paul settled the issue for the early church. Um, and it's, you know, a blessing for us that we have this uh, letter to, to settle the issue. And so really what we have in this passage is Paul um, pounding in one of those stout, foundational nails of truth that hold our faith together. And so I guess what, what I intend to do is just keep hammering on that nail. Um, and so I'm going to um, speak a bit about what Paul is saying here in this passage and, and talk about some of the implications for us. But if we go back to the first verse and we see what Paul starts with, he says, brothers, or some translations say brethren, and some say my dear family. And so that really sets the tone for everything that he's going to say next, right? What Paul is doing is setting a tone of loving affection. And we gather that what his goal is here is to encourage people uh, with the truths he's laying out. And so it's with that tone that we can read what he says next, um, that you don't grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. I think what he's saying here is this isn't a restriction on grief. Uh, what he's saying is you don't have to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. And if we listen to what he says next, we understand why that is. Now, he refers to uh, people as having fallen asleep. And I think it's clear, but just to, to clear up any confusion there might be with that word, what he means is dead. It... <laughs> it uh, it seems like a euphemism, but the word he's using here wouldn't have been misunderstood by uh, the, the Greeks that he's writing to. It's used interchangeably as falling asleep or falling into death, and the context makes it clear he's talking about death. Um, but he does choose this word intentionally right, because it does soften the impact of what he's saying and conveys that when he's saying people are falling asleep, people are falling into death, this isn't a permanent state, but there's something temporary about it and beyond that in verse 16 sorry 14 uh, he speaks about those who have fallen asleep in the Lord and so this gives us kind of an extra picture of um, uh, falling asleep not apart from Jesus but falling asleep with Jesus it reminds me of a time when I heard a husband uh, who had been married to his wife for a very long time. Uh, when he got the news that his wife was diagnosed with a terminal illness, uh, the first thing that occurred to him was that he just couldn't imagine uh, laying down to sleep at night without her by his side. And that the comfort of her presence with him through his life just didn't seem like it could be terminated. And this is what Paul is saying here, that when we pass from mortal life into death. We're not making that transition without the presence of Jesus. That we're not, we're not dying alone. We're not dying without Christ. And so he's going to be with us in life, in death, and beyond death. Now moving on to verse 16, Paul paints this amazing picture of Jesus coming down from heaven and us going up to meet him in the clouds and, you know, this image we may experience in a lot of different ways. Um, sometimes I feel like rolling my eyes at the cheesy picture that I think we've kind of turned this into. Uh, sometimes it feels like a threatening judgment. Um, and so I did a big study on, on this whole image of the clouds. And unfortunately, I don't have enough time to talk about it, but I'm super excited because the picture of the clouds, there's a thread that goes all the way through scripture from the very beginning of the Old Testament. And this image of Jesus coming and being in the clouds carries with it the connotation that he's coming with the presence of the glory of God. And I have a, I even have a personal story about this, this cloud thing that I can't share because I don't have time, but please ask me about the clouds. Ask me about the clouds sometime because I'm excited about it. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe part two. Um, uh, but I guess one thing I will say is in the Old Testament, you know, one of the times that God manifests himself as a cloud is when he meets Moses at Mount Sinai. And he does that in a similar way. There's a loud trumpet call 
And he says he's doing this so that people know that you're speaking with me, talking to Moses. The difference between that picture of the glory of God in the cloud and the picture that we have of Jesus bringing the glory of God with him is that in, uh, at Mount Sinai, God warned people not to approach the mountain because if they did, they would die. Whereas here, we have Jesus bringing the glory of God with him and welcoming us to join him in God's splendor um, you know, with a smile. We can imagine Jesus is, is coming with a smile, beckoning us to join him in God's presence. This is the same uh, picture that Jesus gives in Matthew 24. Um, he describes himself in the same way that Paul uh, is describing it here. And one of the other things that Jesus says is that it's important to know that when he comes back, it's not going to be confusing for us. We're going to know exactly what's going on, and we're not going to miss it. Right? He says that it's going to be the same way that lightning in the east is visible in the west. We're going to recognize that Jesus has come back. So it's not something that we're going to, that we're going to miss when it happens or, or, or have any confusion about. And some people think this is a big metaphor with the clouds. I'm not on board with that, but, but I, I am uh, convinced that we are going to recognize what's going on when it happens. So, so Paul clarified for the church in Thessalonica one of their big points of confusion. Um, and one of the things that was really a foundation of hope for them. And I think that, um, you know, even if we look at the broader context of the New Testament, this hope in Jesus' coming back, this hope in eternal life with him, is something that came under pretty significant attack in the early church. In fact, Paul has to write a second letter to the Thessalonians explaining because somebody apparently forged a letter in Paul's name claiming to the Thessalonians that Jesus had come back and they missed out. So Paul has to renew this um, affirmation of the truth um, that Jesus is going to give us eternal life in him. The same struggles pop up in the Corinthian church and we see that in his letter to the Corinthians. And so I think that this whole issue of hope in eternal life with Jesus and what it means that he's coming back for us continues to be a big battleground. And I think that we come under attack because hope is important. Right? We see in chapter 1, verse 3, that Paul, um, Paul says that it's their hope that inspires their endurance. And in Romans 12:12, 12, 12, uh, he says that we can rejoice in our hope. So this hope gives us endurance and it gives us joy. And those two things, I think the enemy really goes after in us because the enemy wants us to believe that when we die, we've suffered ultimate defeat, right? That we have been defeated physically, emotionally, and spiritually, which is true apart from Christ. But we don't suffer defeat in Christ because he was victorious over death, and so I want to explore the ways that uh, we are attacked in holding on to that belief. Right? One of the ways that I think uh, that, we're, that we struggle is the message that we get from our culture is that this material world is the only world and that the natural world that we experience has nothing over it. Basically, that there is no supernatural world. And, and that is a hard thing to push through right? because we bump up into our own limitations in addressing that. And so I don't have a good way to address that, <laughs> but Jesus does. So I'm going to take us to Jesus' words um, in John chapter 10, uh, verses 24 through 29. Just to set this up, Jesus is teaching a group of people, and these people tell Jesus, they say, hey, uh, are you the Messiah? And if you are, why don't you just straight up tell us. And Jesus says, I did tell you, but you didn't believe me. But that's okay because you're not my sheep. And then he goes on to say, um, we're going to pick this up in verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And so the first thing that I want to take from this is that we who belong to Jesus have heard his voice. 
that Jesus has spoken to us and we have heard that he, uh, that he loves us and we have heard him call us to follow him. And that may have been through uh, his body, the church, through this community, the way that they have expressed love to us, have, has connected us with Jesus' love. It may simply be through scripture and uh, connecting with his love uh, through his words uh, in the Bible. But we who belong to Jesus know his voice. At least we have that, right? We know his love and we know uh, his calling and he's calling us to follow him. And the second thing that I want to take from this passage is in this scenario that uh, Jesus has created, um, we are the sheep and sheep don't know what's going on. You know, the only thing that the sheep can do is follow the shepherd where he leads, which they do because they believe that the shepherd is leading them to a good place, that the shepherd is capable of leading them to a good place, and that he has their best interest at heart. Maybe they don't even really believe that all the time, but the shepherd is going to take them with him anyway. Right? And so I think that's the situation we find ourselves in uh, when we think about what it means to die in Christ. It means that we're following a good shepherd, We know that he's good because we've heard his voice. We've decided to follow him. And so the question becomes, uh, is he good in death and does he have power over death? Knowing that he has the power to transform our hearts, to transform our community, does he have power to bring us out of death? And so we see Paul here uh, appealing to the Thessalonians on the basis of Jesus' resurrection. And so we have that same belief uh, to anchor us because we know Jesus' voice. We know that Jesus conquered death, and we just need to follow him where he leads. There's a, there's a second uh, concern that we encounter a lot when it comes to death, and that concern is what happens to those who die not in him? Right? This, is, this is a big obstacle for some of us, maybe because we've lost loved ones who we're not sure what they believed, or we are sure what they believed, and it wasn't in Jesus. We may even struggle just because we know there are people um, who, it seems to us, never had an opportunity to believe in Jesus, and that becomes a stumbling block um, to having joy even uh, in matters of life and death. We might struggle because we're concerned that um, certain people will be in heaven with us, Right, because, <laughs> because you know, the agents of our suffering in this world, we believe, are not beyond the redemption of Christ. And so, and so we're faced here with the challenge of believing that in life and in death, Jesus is good. So here we do have Jesus' own words um, in John chapter 5, verses 22 and 30. We do know that Jesus says that the one who gets to judge in death is Jesus. That Jesus is the one who gets to decide things. And he says that he judges justly. So if we can hang on to Jesus' goodness, then we can hang on to his justice in what happens beyond the veil between life and death. We also know from our own creed, uh, which says Jesus descended into hell or we might say that a different way. Jesus descended into the realm of the dead. Now this, you know, this part of our creed is anchored in Scripture in First Peter chapter 3 where it says that Jesus went and preached to the dead after he was crucified. Um, that's a confusing verse, and it's hard to decipher exactly what that means, but at the very least we can say that there is no domain outside of Jesus' influence and authority, right? That what happens on the other side of the veil is not outside of Jesus' authority. And if there are people that we care about in this world, how much more do we know that Jesus cares about them as well? Now, a third thing that I think we struggle with is just a really basic attachment to the world. And there are a lot of things uh, that we can say about that. You know, I think on one hand, we really struggle sometimes in following Jesus because we think that we're in process, right? That there are broken things about us that we see Jesus uh, working in our lives, that there are broken relationships. We experience his ongoing restoration and we think, that's not done. We can't, I can't leave until that's finished or I can't meet Jesus until that's finished. 
And, you know, I think that's a legitimate concern. I think what we do in this world is meaningful and, um, and has impact in what happens next. Um, but I do think we need to hold on to the truth that when we go be with Jesus in eternity, he's not, we're not going, the, the action doesn't stop. Right? We're not going to some static place uh, where we have no role anymore. It reminds me of when I go on vacation with my kids and like Eisen in the morning in the hotel room gets all excited about the hotel room and he'll like find the broken pen cap and he'll be playing with that and the dead bugs and the dust bunnies. And he's, you know, it's a whole new world that he's excited about, um, you know, doing his thing with. Um, but we have to like pry him out and say, you know, Eisen, we're going to the beach, you know, like the, we're here to go do something better. And so I think, you know, we, <laughs> we, we tend to get caught up in what we're doing in the moment, but Jesus has us on a good path, uh, whether it's in our life or uh, beyond our death, right? The other thing I'll say about our attachment to the world is that it's legitimate and that uh, the issue of death, whether it's our own or those close to us, is something that's just, it's, it's not supposed to be that way. It's a violation of our created nature to be with God and to live with him forever. And so it really is beyond what we can do. Beyond, it's, it's more than we can handle as people. And so it brings with it genuine suffering and sadness. And so on that note, I'm going to hand things over <laughs> to Michael <laughs> to, to pick up the pieces. Really dumb right now. Okay, all right. Let's see if I can. All right, get it. Yeah, I look great. Okay, you guys are gonna say that no matter what. It's good. All right. Uh, so this is uh this is Ron and I uh, together at my wedding. Um, this was Ron's idea to take this post photo. A good idea, I'd like to add. Uh. So I want to address some of the things that are lingering uh, with this with this verse, and then I want to look at a model of what Jesus offers um, in his life, his earthly life, uh, dealing with the death of Lazarus. So, well, okay. So we started with uh, verse 13. We went to verse 18 in chapter 4. That really should be bigger, but I didn't have time to... I should have had time, but I didn't have time to format, so I apologize. Um, But I'm going to focus on verse 13 and verse 18, which is the beginning and the end. So we've got all this in the middle, and and, and Ron said there's this awesome imagery of the clouds. We had these great long conversations, the two of us together. We're really good friends. I found it really a rich, awesome, great, encouraging time to spend with Ron. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to talk to you all for the three hours that we ended up doing, so... Um, I'm going to focus on verse 13 and verse 18. So this is what it says. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. And then skipping to the very end. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. These words referring to everything that Paul has just shared with them about Jesus coming back and the, those who are dead in him, in him, who are believers, meeting him in the air, and all of us together will be um, continuing on with him in eternal life. Okay. So in talking with Ron, I wasn't really aware of this, but uh, apparently um, he has heard, uh, maybe even multiple times, different preachers say that this is to be taken as a command, verse 13. Something like, you should not grieve like the rest of mankind. Giant finger wag, right? Okay, don't do it, right? Like, if you're grieving, you're like, oh, I'm doing something bad, okay? Um, I don't think that's 
the correct way to take this verse. I think to the extent that that's been preached like that, I apologize on behalf of Christianity, okay? I apologize on behalf of the church. I, I don't think that that's Paul's intention, and I don't think it should be ours in reading this book, in the reading this verse either. I don't think it's a command. It's actually an encouragement. Remember the tone of this entire letter is one that's very friendly and very excited about these, these Thessalon- Thessalonians, these people who are there in the church at Thessalonica. Um, and he's just concerned that they're grieving when they need not to. Okay? He's concerned that they're really, really anxious when they don't have to be. It's not that it's inappropriate for them exactly, and it's not that it's wrong or sinful. It's just he doesn't want them to be without hope in the way that they're mourning. So it's an encouragement of our shared knowledge of hope in Jesus and the resurrection that he's going to bring that we have confidence in. And no one who is in Jesus is going to miss out on this. Okay, furthermore, it would go against the command that Paul and Jesus give to mourn with those who mourn. So if, if you're taking it as a command to not mourn or not grieve, it just, it, it's contradictory with Scripture. Paul says elsewhere, this is what you should do. You should mourn with those who mourn. Quite the opposite of not grieving, do grieve. When those around you are grieving, especially about death, do that with them. And this is part of what I want to lead into about this being a communal activity. Uh, it's an, he, he ends this passage, this section that Ron and I have to talk about by saying, encourage each other with these words that I've just given you. Um, so uh, I want to talk about a little bit about what, uh, what we should and shouldn't do in that process. So um, I'm going to lead into it a little bit humorously uh, because I am not a morning person. Um, and I get quite grumpy in the morning, in fact, just as a natural state of things. So uh, there's this great proverb that Ron pointed out to me, and I thought it was hilarious and so on point. Um, it says, if anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. Okay, I'm sure you can all just use your imagination, visualize this. I'm sitting at the table all grumpy trying to eat my cereal, and you say, good morning! You know, like, and I'll be like, mm go away okay all right so it's kind of humorous now the more serious point another proverb like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar being poured on a wound is one who sings songs to a heavy heart So I want us to be thoughtful about what it means to encourage one another with the words that we have in Jesus and what it should mean to mourn with those who mourn. I don't think it means to try to cover over or paper over those who are in grief, covering over their mourning with an artificial happiness. Or even in a real happiness. I think it's, um, it's damaging. It's, it's not right. It's not the way that we should be going about our lives of encouragement and joy and uh, building each other up in the hope of Jesus. It's certainly not, I think, mourning with those who mourn. So you can see the imagery here. It's, it's, uh, if, if you're singing happy songs or trying to convince someone, no, don't mourn, it's really a happy thing. It's a great thing that this person has died. They're now with Jesus. Okay? Um, as much as it's true, I think it's like robbing someone on clothing when it's cold or like pouring vinegar on an open cut. It hurts. It really does. Okay. So what does it look like to encourage one another with these words? Well, this is the way Ron phrased it, and it was so good I stole it. So um, I think we should refrain from delegitimizing how someone feels. How they're feeling is appropriate. Ron just said, death is a cosmic rift in how things are supposed to be. It is not God's original plan for us as humans, 
and it's certainly not his final plan for us. Death is not the way things are supposed to be. It is a giant aberration in the way that God wants things to be and created them from the very beginning. So please, please do not use verse 13 to correct someone's feelings, to say, you should not feel this way, okay? You should not be sad. You should be happy. Please don't do that. I think the world often wants to deny the reality of death. I I hear a lot of times um, from friends and neighbors, people sharing on Facebook, articles that I read about, oh, we're so caught up in how death is so sad. We should really be thinking, oh, it's just so natural. There's nothing really to be afraid of. There's really nothing to be sad about with death. It's just a natural process. Why are we so caught up? You know, why are we so bothered by it? And I'm like, no, we should be really bothered by it. Okay. It's, it's terrible. Death is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, it's overwhelming. And I think when we tell people, don't be sad, be happy. Uh, this person's now getting their angel wings or whatever, okay? Uh, on top of that, I think being bad theology, I, I think it's also just inappropriate. It's, it's not encouraging. It's not helpful. So we, when we do that kind of thing, I think are also denying the reality of death. It's not that we're saying there is no death or that death is a good thing, but we're saying something not too far away from it when we say, when we try to convert people's grief into happiness too quickly, too easily, too flippantly. Okay, so how should we do this? Now that we've talked about what not to do. All right, great, Michael. You told me not what not to do. What should I do? What positive thing should I do? Well, I think that Jesus' story of how he deals with the death of Lazarus is really instructive. So I want to read through the whole thing. Okay, so it's very, very tiny. I apologize. It should have been much bigger, but I didn't get the formatting right for this computer. Okay, so I'm going to read it off my iPhone because I can't even read that. That's too tiny. Okay, so this comes from John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same person who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back. Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, He went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. I love this. Okay, so his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking about his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. Okay, all right, sorry. We're on the next slide. So then he told them plainly, Jesus (laughs) Jesus says, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there so that you may believe but let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Um, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. 
do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Okay. I think I'm somewhere in there. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village and was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place when Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Okay, so I'm going to end there. Some observations. And I'll get to this in a moment. Okay. Jesus goes to where Martha and Mary are mourning. Others who are part of Mar- Martha and Mary's community, who knew them, who knew Na- Lazarus, gather with them to mourn, to grieve. They are physically together. Okay, there's a point in Jesus staying away for a while, and he explains this to the disciples who don't quite go and understand what's going on. Maybe we do. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but he eventually physically goes to where they are. So this gets to my first point. I don't mean this to be uh, quite as mean as it sounds, um, but I wanted a quick little phrase that was easy to remember. Um, And so for me, the double up kind of made sense. So uh, show up and shut up is the first principle. Okay. All right. Um, If possible, be physically present with those who are mourning. Mourning with those who mourn, I think, means to go to them, if at all possible, and actually be there. And I think one of the best ways that we can be present for people who are mourning and to mourn with them is to not even say anything at all and just be there. Um, I think we get in trouble and say things like what I was talking about earlier when we start to open our mouths and... um, and try to be encouraging by verbally saying stuff. I don't mean never say anything, but um, I mean err on the side of being quiet and being physically present. I think you can say a lot simply by saying, if someone says, why, or what is this, or explain to me, you can say, I don't know, and give them a hug. I think that's far more effective most of the time in mourning. And I think mourning with those who mourn means to be authentic to the sadness um, that people are feeling and and to yours. I I think if you um, allow yourself to feel um, and know what's going on and think about the death that those, the person that who has died is experiencing, uh, you will feel sad, I think, a lot of times. But even more importantly than that, it's not about your sadness, it's about the other person's the family members, uh, the friends. And I think you should join them in whatever way that they are mourning, so long as it's appropriate and not sinful. Um, and keep it simple. Notice what Jesus says about uh, to Mary and Martha. Okay? He asks them, do you believe in the resurrection? Okay? Do you believe that I am the Messiah? So we can say, if we're going to say things, we can say things like, we have hope in Jesus, right? So-and-so is with Jesus. And we could say these very simple, basic truths that don't require a whole lot of theological storytelling. And I think that's a better, actually, that we stick to those very simple statements. As, Paul say, as uh, Ron was saying, um, it, death for us is a veil that we don't really quite understand what's going on. We're like sheep, So we can stick to the very basic truths that we know. 
that are encouraging and give hope. Okay, so I'm guessing that I'm going way over time because my wife was like, speed it up like this. Okay. <laughs> but uh, we all wanted to end there. Um, so, three ways to respond to the message tonight, as there are usually for any message. We have offering baskets. Um, Paul also instructs the church in his letters to give generously. But there's no expectation that you give, especially if you are just visiting with us. If you're not part, a member of our community, this is not something that we're pushing on you. But if you would like, please do give generously. Uh, A second way to respond is that we have a white chair back there that we call the healing chair if you would like prayer for anything Um, if you're struggling with your sin it's the sin of the world sin against you um, you can sit in that chair and someone will come to pray with you and for you if you give them a very very short explanation of what it is that you would like prayer for and then they can follow up with you later with a longer explanation if you'd like to do that the third way is the way that we celebrate and stand with Jesus' death and demonstrate the way that he paid for our sins by breaking bread, representing his body, dipping it in juice or wine to represent his blood shed for us. And it's a way of announcing physically that Jesus has paid the penalty and the cost of our, our sins and the sins of the world and that he rises from the dead and conquers that death. Um, we're going to have some meditation music and um, feel free to talk to Ron or I later if you have more things that you'd like to, to ask or say. <laughs>